Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Mark Henry. I'm a senior engineer with Opmantic's North American office located in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, in this week's uh, weekly uh, webinar series, we're going to be talking about how to develop a strategic NOx service using Opmantic's commercial open source solutions. You'll notice that uh, all of the attendees are on mute during the presentation. Uh, just to keep down the interruptions, keep down feedback, background noise, keyboards, that kind of thing. If you have a question to ask, please use the GoToMeeting webinars uh, chat window. Uh, there's also a questions panel you can use as well if you'd prefer to go that route. We will be having a question and answer session at the end, and we've allowed ample time for that. So if you want to hold your questions to the end, that's fine as well. Uh, just to know for everyone, uh, this session will be recorded uh, and made available to everyone uh, uh, at the end. Um, when we're done the session and before the Q&A, we'll actually stop the recording. That way, if any of you are shy and don't want to ask a question out loud, um, you can wait to the end and, uh, and it won't be recorded. So topics for today. So we're going to be covering four kind of high-end pieces. Um, it's important to understand that this is not a hands-on seminar today. This is really much more business theory. Um, how to structure uh, from a standpoint of organization, staffing, manpower, uh, services, and SLA. So we're going to talk about the differences between a traditional NOC model and a strategic NOC. We're going to talk about how to develop a service catalog with measurable SLAs. We're going to touch on architecting a solution for fast client onboarding and scalability. And of course, we're going to be focusing that on using Opmantic solutions, both our free and open source solutions and our commercial uh, add-on modules. We're going to talk about how to identify your fully loaded costs and also how that will uh, affect your ROI and the ROI of your customers and uh, their lines of business. So first things first, we're going to talk about the differences between a traditional NOC model and a strategic NOC. So a traditional NOC model uh, is what you see at probably the, the bulk of most businesses, especially small and medium-sized businesses, not so much at enterprise, um, but we still see it even in the clients we work with uh, at around 50% uh, of what we consider to be enterprise size customers. Generally speaking, the NOC function is embedded as part of a larger uh, network server application support process. And what I mean by that is simply that um, the, the idea of a NOC, people aren't actually you know, monitoring uh, services and applications and user experience. Uh, instead, they're waiting for a help desk ticket to come in or someone to, to dial in a phone. Meanwhile, uh, they're splitting their time and their attention between uh, maintaining equipment, doing remote desktop, work with clients, patching software, doing antivirus stuff. They're doing fault resolution, but they're also doing equipment, routine equipment maintenance. They're doing equipment refresh. So they're configuring new routers and switches, boxing them, shipping them off to remote sites, getting them installed. Um, and really the, the monitoring focus is more on individual equipment status. Um, sometimes that functionality is siloed. So you might have a couple of people focusing on network equipment, a few people working on servers. You might even separate servers by operating systems. So you might have a team of Linux people and a team of Windows people. Um, fault response is primarily reactionary. Again, you're waiting on a ticket to be created. You're waiting on a phone call to come in from a client and say that their, uh, their user experience uh, has been impacted. Uh, there is little or no automation. So how does that compare to a strategic knock offering, right? So when you look at a network operations center, um, a strategic network operations center is really all about improving collaboration and response with the entire business. So it's the concept of focusing on user satisfaction and not equipment state. So you're not necessarily focusing in on whether uh, a router or an interface is impacted, if an individual device's performance is up or down. You're really focusing more on application performance and are the applications working well and are, is the overall user experience working well? So can users open and close applications, open documents, uh, get access to storage, read and write information? Can they go to the internet? Uh, do they have good access to SaaS software providers, uh, applications? Is Microsoft 365 working? That type of an approach. 
A strategic NOC also offers a clearly defined list of services. So what things they do, what things do they offer to their customers and the lines of business that they serve. And these are married uh, into some kind of a pricing or value that, that, uh, that the strategic NOC offers to the customer set. Initial fault response, uh, fault response is automated. And that's a that's a really kind of a an important key piece here, is that in a traditional knock, um, when a uh, when a fault is picked up, whether it pops up on our screen, whether it's a an email that comes into a help desk system, a ticket that pops up, or a phone call that starts, usually it's at that point that people start doing some kind of a fault response. With a strategic knock, you want to automate that as much as possible. So uh, uh, electronic systems, event management systems, see the fault, understand what's happening with the fault, start troubleshooting procedures immediately, start collecting uh, information uh, for a later analysis. Uh, if there are specific responses that need to be made, um, a service is down, a server is overloaded, uh, it can actually take proactive response to that type of, uh, type of fault or type of event. Uh, also, uh, self-service is a key component at all levels inside a strategic knock. Uh, strategic knock. What I really mean by that, and this is an important piece, again, to understand, is that a knock center needs to be able to automate uh, its fault response, but also allow end users, customers, to come in and gather information. It can be something as simple as um, automating password reset functionality. Right, being able to go to a, a custom website and be able to reset their own passwords. It might be something more, uh, you know, at a higher level of, of functioning or operation. We'll show that later on. The concept that you might actually provide an internal portal or platform for your clients to come in and see how well their applications are performing, uh, see how well their um, their ISP connections are working, uh, what's their bandwidth, what's their uh, overall trending and performance on the equipment that supports their applications that they find are key pieces for their line of business. Another piece of a strategic NOC is that the NOC itself is actively involved with DevOps procedures, application development, testing QA and deployment of applications throughout the business. In a traditional NOC, the traditional knock is usually the last person to know that some line of business or some department has purchased an application, uh, is provisioning service, uh, servers, is setting that application up on the network, um, and is rolling that application out to, to their consumers. The problem with that is, is that that application can uh, consume uh, functions and features, bandwidth, um, overload certain sections of the network. By getting the strategic knock involved up front, with application design development, early QA and testing, uh, early user experience testing, uh, but also being able to do things like synthetic transactions through the application as well, then you get a higher level of reliability in the application and you also get improved uh, user experience for that application deployment as well. Uh, and finally, a big differentiating factor of the strategic NOC is that the NOC maintains proactive communication channels with the customers and lines of business. I don't just mean automated emails uh, with PDFs, with nice charts and graphs, and here's how your different devices have been doing over time, but I mean actually proactive, you know, 15 minute, 30 minute meetings once a month with each line of business where the NOC man management team reviews what types of issues happened, what applications are having the most uh, user experience problems, uh, where those problems uh, exist, how the different uh, equipment is trending on performance, um, you know, what plans there are to upgrade uh, that equipment or replace that equipment over time to improve user experience. So it's a proactive communication. It's more of a partnership. Again, it's all about collaboration and response. So what does this lean to? What is the, what is kind of the driving factor of these things? Why do you want to, besides all those little individual pieces between the differences, um, so where are we leading towards, right? So it's part of the uh, the ITIL model. Uh, this is part of the IT service management maturity model that we have laid out here. Uh, kind of the standard uh, traditional NOC model lies somewhere between a level zero and a level one on the IT service management maturity model. Whereas once you really start moving into a strategic NOC, you move very, very quickly into a level two, level three position. And depending on what services you offer, you may actually move up to a, a level four.
All of this, of course, uh, drives improvements in performance for your network, for your user experience, and of course, increases your value to the organization. So what are the overall benefits? Why should you look to convert from a, a, a traditional NOC to a strategic NOC model? So we've covered some differences, you know, line item concepts that are there, uh, but really it drives to these four pieces, right? It's overall, it's reduced time spent on routine responses. The engineers that are manning the NOC are gonna spend less time doing kind of the day-to-day -day routine chores. You're gonna be looking to automate many of them with DevOps processes. You're going to be automating a lot of responses to uh, faults and events. Uh, you're gonna be providing self-service uh, ability to a lot of your customers. So they won't be calling in and saying, um, you know, what's my available bandwidth right now? You know, are we having problems? I'm having issues with VoIP. Instead, they can go to a self-service uh, portal and actually see what's happening uh, to their applications and their various services. This will all lead to improved reaction time for a user experience impacting faults. Uh, it's gonna give you reduced time to fault resolution because you're gonna understand more about how an individual choke point, let's say high bandwidth on a, uh, on a switch interface, how is that impacting uh, specific applications, right? So you'll be able to follow down from the application uh, user experience point directly to that individual choke point piece and understand what your root cause is. You're also gonna have the ability to predict outages and degradation. So a lot of this moving from a traditional to a strategic knock is not just monitoring applications and not just individual pieces of equipment, but it's gonna be understanding uh, what's the overall trending pattern for different types of equipment and how that impacts the performance or the user experience of the different applications that are hosted and working across your, uh, uh, your network. Again, if any of you have questions, feel free to act, uh, ask out in the uh, GoToWebinar chat panel uh, or raise a question. So once you've made the commitment, you wanna move from a traditional knock setup to a strategic knock, or maybe you don't even have a defined knock. You just have kind of an IT department that's uh, handling running uh, your business and dealing with faults and you know, uh, uh, doing uh, uh, you know, equipment refreshes and, and upgrades and doing equipment rollouts. And you wanna split off and you wanna portion out uh, a group of people and say, you are the knock team. So where do you start with that concept? Well, it, it really starts with the, the idea of building out a service catalog. Even before you figure out how many people are on the team or who the team is, you need to understand what services the strategic NOC team is going to offer. So three big pieces for this that we recommend. Uh, the first concept is, again, you're getting away from the concept of monitoring individual pieces of equipment and instead monitoring applications. That doesn't mean that you monitor less pieces of equipment necessarily. You may still monitor all of the network devices um, that are that are in your infrastructure. But what you do is you organize those into how those uh, different network devices, uh, servers, routers, switches, hubs, firewalls, load balancers, et cetera, work together to deliver specific applications. The focus being on application monitoring rather than uh, individual equipment monitoring. So we recommend that you offer uh, at least two, but possibly up to th a three tier system for application monitoring. The concept would be to offer uh, three different levels of services. So you might offer a bronze level, uh, which uh, you know we've defined here as the idea of just monitoring the underlying equipment and services required for an application. So for example, you might have a, a three tiered application. So you've got a, a database backend. So let's say it's going to Microsoft SQL Server. So that's on, uh, on one server. You have a business logic middle tier. So something application running on some middle layer. And then on the front end, maybe you have uh, Internet Information Server IAS or Apache Tomcat uh, as the front end for the application. Uh, all three of those or groups of them can, could exist on the same server or they might be spread out across three different servers. You might have load balancers in between them. You probably have a switch, uh, at least one switch if not multiple switches in between those servers as well. And so what you might do is then monitor all those individual pieces along with the interfaces that make up, that connect, that interconnect all those different devices, and then roll those up into the concept of monitoring that as an application being served. The next level, uh, the silver level, 
would roll up everything that bronze does and then you would also add in custom automated responses to defined faults so for example uh, if you're if you're going to be monitoring the latest greatest home built uh, widget application that your company builds Uh, you may work with that development team to understand uh, maybe there's an application log that can be parsed. Maybe the application can generate custom events uh, and call into uh, an API in your monitoring system. Um, maybe you can monitor uh, different types of uh, SNMP MIBs to monitor uh, how well that, uh, that application is running. So you'd look at monitoring certain things specifically for that application. <coughs> Pardon me four defined faults, and then understanding how you respond to them. So for example, the application development team or the outside vendor might tell you uh, if certain uh, types of services are demonstrating uh, high memory usage uh, or are holding too many CPU cycles for too long, that that would indicate that the application is having performance issues and that that service might need to be restarted or that the server itself might need to be rebooted. So understanding those types of responses, things that would normally be done, you would actually program those into our event management system that would say, if these uh, certain set of circumstances are met, then respond with this type of response. And again, this is the idea of doing custom automated responses. So kind of uh, general uh, event response, things like um, if you lose connection with a, with a device, uh, being able to ping it, being able to do an MTR uh, or a trace route on that on that specific device that's dropped offline, that would be a standard automated response. Those should be built in anyway, but a silver tiered uh, application monitoring uh, service would be all about doing custom defined responses to specific things that that application will do. The goal level would be silver plus the addition of synthetic transactions and deploy user experience monitors. So what I mean by synthetic transactions is the ability to exercise that application as much as the application will let you from the user interface all the way back through the business logic layer uh, into the database and back if possible. Um, Automatic, we, uh, we've done lots of different implementations for customers. Uh, there are loads of different ways of doing synthetic transactions. Usually it's easier on a, uh, um, on a web front end, on something that uses a web front end through Internet Explorer uh, or through Apache, and being able to either call special uh, web pages that exercise the uh, the application itself, or be able to call a web page and do something like uh, log in with a set of stored credentials, execute some kind of a transaction on a web form, uh, wait for a result that comes back from the application, and test that that's the correct result that you expected for. So it's do, doing those types of synthetic transactions to exercise the, uh, the application. And of course, if you can do those types of synthetic transactions from multiple locations, so for example, for those of you who are running businesses that are uh, located in multiple geographic regions, maybe you have offices in New York, office in LA, uh, but your application is fed from a data center in Washington, DC. So you wouldn't necessarily wanna test user experience just from the data center in Washington, DC, You'd want to have uh, user experience monitors in uh, Los Angeles and also in your New York office that exercise those synthetic transactions, timed those transactions, and then made sure that those transactions were executing at a speed uh, and accuracy level that was acceptable for your user experience. The second service that you might want to, uh, that a strategic knock would want to offer, would be performance trending. Again, the concept here is to uh, trend the underlying equipment to understand what, how that's going to impact uh, usability, but also how it's going to impact investment needs. So it's looking at your uh, interface bandwidth usage over time, understanding where you are in the 95th percentile, um, understanding perhaps where you might have to start looking into making investments with your ISP um, for your internet connectivity between points, uh, understanding where you might have to uh, look at overloaded routers or switches where you're running high on CPU or low on memory um, and where you're looking at uh, dropped packets, errors, emissions, those types of things, and then graphing those out over time, grouping those types of pieces of equipment together again uh, by the underlying equipment that supports a specific application 
and keeping track of those types of performance pieces so that you can make proactive recommendations to the customer or business line. Number three, the third part in developing a service catalog would be providing self-service tools. So there's a, there's a lot of tools on the market depending on what services uh, your business is offering that the IT department is offering uh, throughout the company itself. Uh, I mentioned the idea of being able to reset passwords, that type of kind of entry level pieces. The, the next level up when it comes to application monitoring and performance trending is being able to provide custom dashboards to your customers and their lines of business so they can log in and see how their applications are performing. And so you might provide uh, specific application performance dashboards uh, on a uh, customer or line of business basis for their, for their individual applications. And you might have things like uh, your VoIP backbone, so uh, lag time, uh, drop packets, um, all that type of echo jitter response type thing. So you might have uh, generic dashboards that you make available to everybody that talks about how well the VoIP uh, system is working across the entire uh, the entire company, or at least you know within their region, perhaps. So a lot of different ideas are available there. Again, the concept is through self-service is to reduce the number of inbound phone calls, right? That generate uh, uh, kind of breaks in the day for information that the customer should be able to get themselves. So once you understand what services you want to offer, you want to look at what service level agreements or SLAs your NOC team can support. So again, we're, we're still not looking at how many people are on the NOC team. We're not talking about what their experience or capability level is. We're trying to figure out what SLA the business needs the NOC team to be able to provide. <clears throat> so one of the first key factors is understanding what the impact is um, on network usability, on application usability, based on an SLA performance level. So if you're looking at a percentage of uptime, so just looking at an SLA of 97%. So uh, your software, we're gonna make sure that your, your software, your applications are up 97% of the time. That would mean that company-wide, uh, you'd be okay with, or the, the different customers' lines of business would be okay with up to 1,300 minutes of downtime a month or 263 hours of downtime per year total, again, stretched out. Uh, randomly whenever the uh, the outages happen, uh, all the way to the concept of a SLA of 99.99%, which would equate down to just four minutes of downtime per month or a little less than an hour of downtime per year, again, through the organization and how that, uh, how that impacts. Now, for people who are not IT people, um, you know, it's easy for a manager to look at a chart like this and say, well, of course, we want to be 99.99%. I want very little downtime but it's much more difficult to understand um, how that impacts uh, manning and provisioning a NOC center, but also the entire IT team, uh, and also the realities of equipment maintenance and management. So the first question we always try to ask is, how much downtime can your customer or line of business absorb on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly basis, right? And of course, they'd like to have zero downtime, but the real question is, is how much can they absorb? Right. If they had 15 minutes of downtime, uh, you know, between 9 a.m. and noon, that would be acceptable. It's understanding what things are acceptable and what things are not. Then it's also understanding how that downtime loss of an application can affect business income. So uh, in most cases, and we'll, we'll talk about this later, uh, an hour of downtime on average for an enterprise class client uh, is worth about eleven thousand dollars an hour. You know that's what you lose uh, in an hour of downtime in in any kind of department within a large enterprise customer. However, um, it really depends on how much uh, an individual department depends on the network and what kind of application they lose. Right? Uh, I was talking to a, a rather large TV station uh, just last week. Uh, and they were saying that depending on what time of day it was, uh, they could lose as much as $50,000 a minute if they lost the ability to transmit or if they lost the ability to track, for example, um, that they were displaying the correct um, commercials based on geographic location, 
uh, density and and uh, and demographic information about the viewership. So if they were just if they if they can't track the fact that they displayed the right commercial, then they can't bill for displaying that commercial during prime time, for example, and that could lead to up to fifty thousand dollars a minute. One of the next things that you want to do when you're working on defining your SLA agreements with your client is understanding things like time to uh, to fault or problem response. And that's usually the first touch, right? Um, it's important to understand also what your hours and days of operation are. Are you going to run a 24-7 knock? Is someone going to be actually in an office manning it, ready to answer the phone, ready to respond to emails, uh, monitoring performance application dashboards? to make sure that uh, that applications are running or after hours are you using on call technicians right people that are going to have to carry a beeper uh, or have uh, give out their phone number uh, wake up in the middle of the night to a ring phone and answer it uh, and respond to uh, some kind of recorded message so it's understanding how you're going to be staffing your knock site will actually drive what SLAs you can offer out to the lines of business uh, what problem response time you can offer out. Um, generally speaking, if you're going to be using on-call technicians, you'll want to offer at least a two-hour window, if not longer, for first uh, first response. Um, during the work days, you can generally offer something anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour. So it's, it's keeping those types of things in mind uh, to help you define what your SLA is that you're going to sell back into you, uh, the various lines of business and your customers. So once you figure out what services you want to offer and you want to figure out what SLAs uh, you're going to package those services around, um, then you want to try to figure out how do we actually architect a solution? So what types of software do we need? What types of hardware do we need? How do we put this together so that we can actually offer this out and sell this to uh, our internal customers and our lines of business? So the first step is uh, is really is architecting a solution. Um, we're going to look at this strictly from looking at uh, what uh, Opmantic has for network monitoring solutions. So we're going to start with the concept of um, Opmantic's NMIS, which is our uh, kind of our core free open source platform. If you look at the wheel on the right hand side of your screen, you'll see it's in the center of the hub. It's in big green circle. So NMIS or Network Monitoring Information System that handles all of the core performance and fault monitoring. So again, it is free and open source. We do offer annual support and maintenance contracts for it, but you can spin it up, you can get it running, and it'll do all of your uh, performance and basic fault monitoring, uh, and also escalations and notifications as well. Once you start scaling your solution out, and we'll talk more about scaling in a minute, but once you start scaling your, your solution out, offering it to, uh, to more customers, wanting to provide more services than what NMIS can do on, on its own, um, cover more equipment. You'll want to start looking at Omnitech's commercial solutions as well, which might include Open Audit Enterprise uh, for scheduled discovery and auditing, uh, OPHA, which is our high availability um, and uh, uh, allows you to do uh, horizontal and vertical scalability. Uh, you'll want to look at OP Charts, which handles uh, being able to provide both uh, internal custom dashboards for your teams but also customer portals, right? So we talked about self-service. So OP charts can uh, provide uh, customer portals for customized dashboards. And of course, OP trend for predictive trend analytics. There are a lot more uh, commercial offerings in Opmantic's uh, war chest as well. So, uh, you know, taking a look on the uh, Opmantic website, www.opmantic.com might lead you to a couple other solutions that might be useful. So equipment sizing. Uh, we often get a question: uh, How many uh, how many different devices can an individual server monitor? <coughs> NMIS works really well uh, in a virtualized environment. It does run on 64-bit uh, Linux backbone. Uh, we do recommend uh, presently using CentOS. We do offer a fully uh, configured virtual machine built on built on uh, CentOS 6.9. So you can download that now from our website and see how well NMIS works. But starting off, um, you can do up to anywhere between three and 5,000 devices on an individual uh, virtual machine. 
uh, you'd need somewhere between six and eight virtual CPU and anywhere from 16 to 24 gigabytes of RAM to support that number of devices. And the total number of devices an individual server can handle is really a function of a couple of different things. It's not really the total number of devices, it's really the total number of interfaces you're collecting on. And you can control which interfaces are collected. Uh, we do have uh, kind of top-down rules, uh, global rules that are built. Um, so for existent, uh, example, uh, any interface that does not have a description assigned to it would not be collected. So uh, you can do that. You can also look for keywords and description fields, look for keywords and name fields as well. Um, and again, allow the system to kind of automatically pick and choose which interfaces are collected on and how they're done. Um, total number of devices are also controlled by device latency. So it's the amount of time it takes for Enmis to query the device via SNMP, um, ask for certain uh, OIDs and information from it, the device to respond back and for that information to get back to the server. Um, if you're doing collection every five minutes, then you have to be able to collect from all of the devices on that server before the next collection cycle starts. In the most recent version of NMIS, which is uh, currently version 8.6.3G, uh, we've actually added some ability in there to create multiple different uh, uh, polling um, profiles. So for example, you may poll all of your um, edge devices and service devices uh, once every five minutes. You might do all of your core devices once every three minutes. Um, and then you might have a series of devices that you only care about uh, uh, polling once every hour. So you can set up different polling cycles and then you can assign them by class of device. Uh, that way you can, again, work on spreading out your device licensee a bit um, and uh, reducing the load on the server. And the last piece, which is also a key consideration uh, in determining how many devices an individual server can manage is understanding the, the performance of your storage system. There's an awful lot of data being collected uh, on each collection cycle, especially from large routers or switches uh, with lots of interfaces on them that are being collected. And so you have to have fast storage. If you have really, if you have slow storage, um, if there's a lot of latency involved in it, if there are I/O problems on your storage arrays, then you're not going to be able to complete your uh, your polling cycle. You're not going to be able to write all your data. A lot of information is going to be stuck in memory, and then as the next polling cycle starts, that information is going to be discarded. So, what if you uh, what if you spin up a uh, an NMIS server and you exceed the total number of devices that your server can uh, that your server can support, and you want to do a second NMIS server? So, one of the things we recommend is looking at our commercial module OPHA that allows you to support both horizontal and vertical scaling. So, the concept would be rather than just having one server out in the wild handling and monitoring all of your devices, you might have multiple polling servers. So, they're nothing more than an NMIS server configured to be a a polling server to talk to devices, collect information, and then you'd have a master, uh, one or more masters above those polling servers, and either the master would pull data from the polling servers on a schedule, or the polling servers would push data to the master on a, on a given schedule, uh, or any combination of the two that you want to do. And uh, what you've done there is you've, again, you've scaled things out. You can have multiple polling servers, and they can all report back up. Um, one of the nice key considerations for licensing OPHA is OPHA is uh, licensed on the total number of devices being managed by the master server, not by the number of uh, polling or master servers you have out there. So, you, you know, uh, with OPHA, if you're doing 5,000 devices, you could have two polling servers, each one doing 2,500, a master server that's getting all 5,000 sent to it. Or you could do five polling servers, each one doing a thousand devices, or, or any kind of combination there. Again, rolling those five thousand devices up to the master server. So it becomes very, very easy for you to scale at that point. So what does that look like if you did multiple polling servers uh, and one or more master servers? So the concept here across the bottom of the screen, you have multiple polling servers reaching out. So these are actually reaching out themselves. Uh, they'd have their own perhaps subnets or regional areas that they would handle. They'd be talking to groups of devices out in the wild. 
And then on some schedule, either they would push or, or have pulled from them uh, that performance data and it would, could go to one or more master servers. So in this example, you might have a master server that's your primary master that your NOC uses. They might have a server uh, off-site, maybe it's in your DNR location, maybe it's in the cloud, uh, maybe it's in a, a remote data center, but you'd have a secondary, uh, or you could have a secondary master server, could be a hot standby. Uh, we've run into situations where um, NOC centers are set up as follow the sun, so you might have an east coast and a west coast NOC center. Um, each one might have their own master server, that way latency between the user and the master server is very, very low. And so uh, your West Coast guys use the master server two or you know master server West Coast, however you want to name it. And the, uh, the Knox service on the East Coast might use master server one. Uh, in this uh, drawing, we've also given the, the concept of a, uh, a server set up specifically for client usage. Again, this is self-service, right? The idea that you might have a portal server set up um, running uh, OP charts set up for your clients to log into Again, your clients being your customers, your internal customers, your line of business, et cetera. Uh, you might make that available uh, on the internet, do a reverse proxy, uh, have that available for your clients to log into, whether they're at home, on the road, uh, you know, at any remote location, et cetera. Or you could put it on your, uh, on your intranet along with everything else. Totally up to you. So a bit about uh, the overall application flow, the concept between a, a, a master and a, a polling server. So a polling server being uh, at the bottom of the screen here, below the red line. So all of your, all of your communication um, with the subnets or, or with the different devices that are being managed is happening at that polling server level. So for example, uh, NMIS is handling SNMP and WOI communication. It's also handling service monitoring uh, you'd be running some kind of an event management system. So if you wanted to do executive event management, you'd be handling traps uh, and syslog as well through OP events. OPHA is sitting here on the side and MIS talks to OPHA. OPHA talks to the master and the master makes that information available to the version of MIS on the master. What this allows you to do uh, very, very quickly if your pollers are, uh, especially if they're virtualized, the concept where you could um, take our software, create your own virtual machine image. Um, all of the configuration files are done in text files for all of our products. And so it becomes very easy to uh, spin up a virtual machine, do configure, apply configurations to it using something like uh, Ansible or Puppet, Chef, those types of uh, tools. You could even use our own uh, OP config and apply configuration uh, to a server that way and configure it for a specific location or set of customers and then add devices to that and have it immediately talking to a master uh, with just literally just a few uh, strokes of a keyboard. So uh, a, a few comments on some of our pieces beyond NMIS and OPHA. So we've talked about those two pieces. Again, NMIS being Opmantic's uh, free and open source fault and performance monitoring solution. OPHA being our commercial module to allow you to scale horizontally and vertically with your deployment of NMIS servers. Um, you might also deploy on those NMIS servers OP charts, which would provide um, your NOC center with customized dashboard solutions so they can create application-centered dashboards for their own internal teams. They could also do that, use that to create a portal uh, for your customers for self-service. Right? The whole idea, again, is to reduce client interruptions and give the client that feeling of control and transparency. Clients love that. Uh, another commercial piece you might want to look at, uh, at adding to your offering um, would be to license OP Trend and put it on all of your polling servers. So OP Trend works directly with the uh, performance information that NMIS gathers. Uh, it creates uh, what we call kind of a top 40 dashboard. Excuse me. So you'll see on the on the left hand side, uh, there's a bit of a, a top 40 breakdown. You can see how uh, devices are moving up and down in that billboard type setting. And if we take just one of these devices and we've uh, looked at a, a small bit of time here, you'll see that there's a, an upper uh, control and a lower control. So you'll see those in blue lines here. And I'm highlighting in red. 
the black line is actually the performance of that particular parameter. And this one happens to be uh, CPU usage on a specific server. Each of the regions in blue is a measurement that's gone outside of that upper and control line, what's considered normal. And being able to watch that and watch those trends change over time and watch how devices move in these billboards, you can actually track and see um, which devices are, are trending towards having issues, whether it's um, interface usage, uh, uh, you know, in or out bandwidth usage, whether it's uh, errors and discards, whether it's CPU usage, memory usage, uh, doesn't matter. You can look at the different uh, parameters, roll them all together visually, and then understand how well that device is working over time and where it's trending towards. So once we've talked about, now that we've talked about rather um, the types of software you might employ, right? We've talked about the services your knock would offer. We've talked about the SLAs that you might be able to try to meet. We've talked about the software that you'd want to look at licensing. Um, we've talked about scalability with it. How do you actually uh, onboard new clients and how do you scale? So really it comes down to asking yourself some questions, right? So from a big picture perspective, you're going to ask yourself, um, you know, when you add new clients, are you going to be adding uh, adding those clients to existing polling servers, or are you going to add new servers per client? Um, how are new devices and services going to be added to the polling servers? Uh, what we really recommend is if you're running any kind of a CMDB, something like uh, ServiceNow or Open Audit, even, um, can you use that? Can you use device discovery there? Can you pull information from that type of a CMDB and use that to drive the uh, addition, modification, and retirement of devices. And then will the service be charged back to the client? And this is obviously an internal business discussion. Uh, we do recommend, at least from an accounting standpoint, um, the idea that um, uh, kind of a value be assigned to the services that you offer. Uh, even if internally you're not recouping expenses department by department, um, the ability to go back to a client and say on a monthly basis, these are the services we provided for you. This is the value in the marketplace for those services. And this is what it would charge you were you to go out and find a third party to do this for you. And this is actually what it costs the business to provide this service. So if you're, if you're uh, designing and managing your, uh, your strategic knock, obviously your cost of offering the service should be lower than the cost of them obtaining it from a third party uh, solution provider. The last thing that you want to do is you want to make sure you go back and uh, identify for each client. You look back and you talk to them about what applications are key to their line of business. You'd review the services uh, that you offer, the service levels and the SLAs per application. So some applications, the client is going to say, this application is critical to our day-to-day -day operations. If it were not up and running, we couldn't make any money. And then some of those applications are going to be tertiary. Uh, some are going to be ones that, well, we could do without for a day or two, but not far beyond that. It's not really business impacting. So, for example, um, I've had clients who've come to me and said, look, we have an internal widget application. Um, we use it for video editing, and those videos are then used to create or are used to create commercials, and we sell those commercials, and that's how we make money. So if that if that widget application is broken, is not working, we're not creating commercials. We're not uh, showing commercials in between TV shows, and we're not. We therefore don't have any billable revenue at that point. Um, I've had other clients come in and say, "Hey, Microsoft 365 is an absolutely, uh, you know, critical application for my department. Without Microsoft 365, um, you know, we can't open and, and write contracts, for example. So it's understanding which uh, which applications are key." Uh, having the client decide, do they want to do gold, silver, or bronze monitoring, having some kind of value assigned to each of those. If you're doing some kind of a chargeback, having a charge assigned to each of those, um, and then being able to add those devices in. And the final piece of that puzzle, of course, is understanding once you've identified the list of applications, is being able to 
uh, talk to the application vendor, whether that's an internal development team or whether that's a third party company and find out if there are synthetic transactions that can be uh, executed to exercise that transaction. Almost every modern uh, web delivered application has some kind of a exercise, whether it's an API that can be called and, uh, and a, a transaction pushed through an API, or that's a web page that can simply be logged into uh, to get performance metrics that can then be scraped off that web page. So building a good uh, rapport with the application vendor can be critical in getting access to those types of, uh, uh, those types of resources in custom applications. So finally today, we're gonna to talk about how to understand what your fully loaded costs are. So let's talk about what it costs to man a knock center, right? So we're gonna talk about the fully loaded cost rate. So a fully loaded cost is the concept of taking uh, the base salary and bonuses of an individual and then understanding what the, the modifier uh, might be to understand and, and pick up things like uh, employment taxes and benefits, office space, equipment, management expenses, non-billable work, et cetera. Uh, SAP, uh, for example, SAP uses a modifier of 1.49. So for example, if an employee's uh, salary and bonuses were $100,000, that employee's fully loaded cost would be $149,000 for SAP. That's their kind of their building point. Um, another highly uh, highly used and referred to is 2.34 times the annual salary, and that's actually explained in the uh, the list below. So, for example, uh, you take the uh, uh, the actual annual salary of the, uh, of the individual, multiply it by 1.25 to get their employment taxes and benefits, multiply that result by 1.75 to get the office space and equipment. Multiply that number by 1.25 to get the related management expenses and non-billable work. That total of that, so if you started with that same $100,000 a year annual salary and bonus employee, you'd end up at $234,000. So these pieces come out to that. So for example, if we looked at the salary of a network engineer, um, here in Charlotte, we went out and we looked at salary.com. And we looked at the uh, the salaries uh, and bonuses for a network engineer two and a network engineer three in Charlotte. And the average of that salary is $89,287. That gives us an annual fully loaded cost somewhere between 133,000 if we use the SAP model and 208,000 if we use the uh, uh, the individual buildup of 2.34x. Uh, So let's expand that a little further now that we know what our individual cost is. How do we actually track the value to the business, right? And, and understand our cost. So if we go on the assumption, the basis, that an individual engineer, a single engineer can effectively support between eight and 12,000 devices per shift. So that's based on some, uh, some performance metrics we've collected that Omnitech has collected. It's a bit of proprietary information. Um, it's not super secret or anything, but looking out across some of the much larger NOCs um, and engineering uh, MSPs uh, that use our solutions worldwide, their estimates coming back to us are telling us that an individual engineer can support between eight and 12,000 devices per shift in a NOC atmosphere. So this makes a lot of assumptions though to get to that number. So let's talk about those pieces. First of all, it assumes a properly configured and load balanced implementation of NMIS, OP charts, OP events, OP config, and OP trend. So there's a couple of, of tools here that we really haven't touched on today, uh, including OP events, which is our event management um, and response system, OP config, which is configuration compliance management. And also that it, it uh, kind of assumes that there's gonna be appropriate user and admin training. That should go without saying, uh, this assumes, again, this uh, eight to 12,000 uh, devices per shift assumes automation to add, update, and retire devices. So a NOC engineer does not have to sit there adding devices while they're working on shift. 
right? They're not adding devices, they're not retiring devices, they're not updating devices. That's all being done through some automated process, again, maybe with a CMDB backend. It assumes at least a, serv a silver service level. And as a reminder, that's monitoring underlying equipment and services uh, required for the applications and synthetic transactions and deployed uh, user experience monitors. And finally, it assumes normal system operation. So the system is up and running throughout that, uh, throughout that shift. What that comes down to is that if you assume minimal staffing with, uh, with two resources on shift, so two resources per shift, that comes up to be nine full-time employees to do 24-7 coverage. And that's uh, approximately 1.2 million per year to somewhere around 1.9 million per year fully loaded again so that's all of your software all of your space all of your um, your your cost for your employees all of that is built into this piece and where does that get you down to so if you've done everything right um, the average enterprise class business experience is 262 hours of downtime per year that's an sla of 97 percent Automatic solutions have shown to reduce downtime by an average of 68%. That gets you from 262 hours per year down to around 84 or an SLA of 99%. So you've gained three percentage points. I'm sorry, two percentage points. I can't add. For a $150 million a year business, that creates a savings and revenue and productivity of $2 million. For an ROI of 93%, and a payoff of less than 10 months on your investment uh, in making the shift to a strategic knock and investing in Automantic solutions. A lot of numbers there, um, but these are, these are uh, really, they're not subjective, they're objective. Um, they're based on uh, Automantic's more than seven years of being in business, of NMIS being released and being used now by uh, more than 115,000 businesses worldwide uh, and literally something along the lines of $9 billion of uh, equipment being monitored, managed uh, 24 hours a day currently with Automantic Solutions. So I thank you all very much for your time today. As I mentioned earlier, I'm going to turn off recording now.